Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us here at the American Enterprise Institute for this conference on the Foreign Agents Registration Act. I'm delighted to be joined, and I'm going to go in order down our panel. Their full bios are available to you on our website. So I'm just going to briefly summarize. Um, John Demers is the uh, Assistant Attorney General for National Security, and, uh, and Farah is within his remit. Claire Finkelstein is, a, uh, is the, goodness me, I can't read my handwriting, the Biddle Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and the founder of Penn Law's Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. And Rob Kellner, at the end, is the chairman of Covington's uh, Election and Political Law Practice Group, who also has practiced a great deal in this area. So, uh, just to preview, we're really going to have a conversation here today. Um, first of all, it's going to be a conversation up here, and then it's going to be a conversation with you. There's a lot to talk about, and nobody's giving a presentation, so if there's something that's been left out, keep it in mind, and we'll, we will come back to it. So Farah has been in the news uh, a great deal lately for, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, and doubtless will remain in the news. But uh, for those who are less familiar with it, this is a law that was passed in 1938. We've got some of the operative text up in tiny, tiny little print up on the <laughs> wall for you to have a look at, but it is actually a longer piece of legislation. So I would like to start with the, the general. John, you know, the, the sort of the most general uh, uh, questions about this. Is it your feeling that this is a law that uh, that needs updating, that needs um, that needs modernization? We're in a totally different world than the world we contemplated then, when we mm -hmm. were thinking about the Germans um, or the Japanese. What? How? Do, how do you see it at DOJ? So the way you know we see it, and oh, see, it's an even smaller print right here. In front uh, of <laughs> Is I, I don't know that it, it doesn't need an overhaul in my view. What what I find fascinating about this law, and I think it's actually a rather elegant solution, at least conceptually, to a difficult problem that is full of sort of First Amendment implications. But uh, is you know, whenever I see a law like this that's 80 years old, and you read the history of it coming up from Nazism and communist uh, propaganda in the U.S., you think, okay. We've done this before. We've dealt with this issue before. We, we've lived through this before. So Farah celebrated its 80th anniversary just last year. We released a whole number of opinions to sort of improve our, the transparency of our work on its 80th birthday. Um, it's uh, a law that as we, you know, I think we are refocused on it at the department in light of um, an inspector general report, which was issued about two years ago and then also, obviously, all of uh, what we've seen coming out of um, the 2016 election and a lot of the cases that have come up out of that. So as we work through uh, the statute, I think you know, we continue to look at it um, to see whether there are improvements that need to be made. But it's not a law, I think, that needs you know, an overhaul. For me, it gets at the essential problem together with a criminal statute, uh, 18 U.S.C. 951, uh, which is the problem of covert foreign influence in, uh, in the United States. Okay, so this, this is important, and I want to stick with you for a second, because um, what, you're, what you're talking about, then, is, is a desire on the part of a foreign principal to do something uh, that is not apparent to the public eye. So this is really, from your standpoint, not even about influence, it's about disclosure. Because of course, as originally <clears throat> conceived, it wasn't about disclosure, it was about the Soviets and the Nazis and others having malign influence. Mm -hmm. So just sort of... I mean, concept, the idea is foreign governments and foreign principles, as the, the, the term under the statute, foreign individuals, can speak, and they can speak about issues that are important to Americans, but they, when they speak, they need, the American public needs to be able to identify the speaker. So the problem is when foreign governments or foreign individuals speak through intermediaries, and it's not apparent that the real speaker is not that intermediary who's often an American person, but rather the foreign government. So, uh, 
Claire, one of the issues you brought up when we were talking about this is this concern that you have on the on the First Amendment side, because you know if if in fact this is about transparency, it's really not about curtailing the right to speak. But of course, there's there have been some very substantial changes in the sense that um, in the sense that. What, what I would call foreign propaganda organizations, but organizations that nonetheless right. call themselves yeah, RT, let's say, right. um, and others um, have been, have been uh, forced to register uh, under, under FARA. So where do you see the line? What are your biggest concerns? There are some serious First Amendment concerns. Um, the fact that RT has had to register may not concern that many people because it does not look like RT is an independent news organization, but rather a tool and spokesperson uh, for the Russian government. But uh, now there's talk about having um, Al Jazeera register. Uh, then you know, where does it go from there? Uh, a protection in the law is that the organization, the press organization, would have to be really under the control of a foreign government so that they do not have the independence that we typically expect of a press organization. But there will be great uh, areas of gray uh, marginal cases that will be very hard to call. One of the worries is then when an organization has to register uh, under the statute, they lose their congressional press credentials. So FARA then becomes the tool for uh, identifying an organization as, in effect, a false, using uh, journalistic credentials or media credentials as a false front uh, and becomes the vehicle for decredentialing the press. So l let me press you on this because, I mean, the, the act of registrating, re registrating, registering um, itself is, is, is really not fraught with judgment. Um, in other, there are plenty of countries where foreign press agencies actually have to register. Uh, when I was a journalist back in the Stone Age, we worked in the foreign press building in Jerusalem, and therefore we were all foreign press, and we had IDs that said foreign press on it. So the registration itself isn't the problem that you see. If that decredentialing on the Hill were taken away, would you then view it with the same concern? I think that that might make some difference um, so that if it's purely a transparency statute, right, please be aware that this organization is speaking for a foreign government or is um, funded by or controlled by a foreign government. But um, And there's nothing in the statute that requires Decredential. There's nothing. That's right. right. I mean, so that's it doesn't a separate have to be organization the case. making a separate decision. But yet, um, mm -hmm. I do think that the statute has a point at the same time in getting at uh, foreign media organizations that, in fact, are not functioning with the independence that we expect the media to function with. And so there is a, a reason mm -hmm. why, on the other hand, you might want the decredentialing, but those gray area cases might make one very concerned about it. Gary, yeah, can I address a couple of those Absolutely. points? Absolutely. Um, actually, I do think registering as a foreign agent is highly stigmatizing. And there are many international news organizations that are extremely resistant to being labeled as foreign agents, not only because it causes credentialing problems, and even if you could deal with the one in Congress, there might be credentialing issues elsewhere in the country, but because it makes it difficult for them to collect information as reporters. If they are known to be a foreign agent or once registered even have to disclose that they're a foreign agent, or once registered, anytime they distribute materials, they have to label it, indicating that they're a foreign agent and reference the Department of Justice. That's highly chilling to the typical journalistic process. So I actually think the major issue with news organizations is that by labeling them a foreign agent through registration, you really do make it extremely difficult for them to function. I'd also just say more generally, um, I personally do think the statute needs a, a major overhaul. That's where we've got a little bit of a difference of opinion. Uh, it's a 1938 statute. The amendments since then have been very minor. It has phrases in it that are fairly meaningless in the 21st century, information service employee. It has other phrases like a request from any foreign principal that are extraordinarily broad, that in theory, if you read the statute literally, any request from a foreign entity would trigger the statute with a few qualifications. That's really unacceptably vague and, and broad. 
So I do think it's a statute that is way behind the times, and that even if one agrees in principle with its objectives, it needs to be updated for the 21st century. If I can just add to that about public funding of media organizations, I mean, th this can have a chilling effect. So if you talk about the BBC, for example, um, one worry is, you know, do we start thinking about the, the BBC as the spokesperson for the British government? We don't... I, I don't think anybody thinks right, that. Right. <laughs> but, but, but it requires you to make very fine judgment calls about the degree of independence of a press organization relative to a government that, from which they may be receiving funding. And one worries about the chilling effect of federal funding of press organizations. Okay, so let's... I, I mean, I think you know. I hear everything you're saying, and I, and and the default for for most uh, for most people is is to err on the side of First Amendment rights um, and to really bend over backwards. That's certainly our our tradition in the United States. On the other hand, and I want to give you a chance to jump in because this was a recent decision that was made uh, requiring these FARA these FARA designations. The funny thing about RT, and to a certain extent, I would say it's slightly less uh, about Al Jazeera, but there are others as well, um, you know, whether it's uh, La Prensa in Cuba or um, others that are in fact state propaganda organs that exist to serve the agenda of the dictator or would-be dictator. Um, so, you know, it's good for, it is actually good for people to know that these are not real reporters. These people are not reporters. You know, if you're working for Russia today, you are not a reporter. You are working for the Russian government. You cannot question Vladimir Putin. So help us sort of help us navigate, understanding that the tastes and, and attitudes toward this are going to change. So I mean, that, and I think you made a point that was my reaction to a lot of what you said, Claire, which is, it that's it's just fine as long as it's appropriately applied, obviously in the right context. So we have to have an evidentiary basis, of course, to say. When you act, would be reporter, you're actually acting at the at the direction and control of the government, and you're not, you know, you don't have the sort of independent journalistic uh, ethos that we think of when we look at a reporter. And in fact, not labeling you as a reporter, as a, a foreign agent, is misleading because you're presenting yourself to the American people as somebody who's independent and and right. thinking their own thoughts, but you're not you're getting your thoughts from a foreign government. And so really that's all we're saying. But you're still allowed to express all of the thoughts that that foreign government has and Americans are allowed to consider those as they consider the view that they take on whatever the policy issue is. And so I wanna, I wanna let Rob, uh, who, who sort of brought up this stigma issue, um, do you, I wonder whether, I, I understand how as a talking point that that is actually an issue for, for a press organization. But is it, is it really an issue in practice? Um, because of course, I can't tell you, f among, among my fairly large acquaintance in Washington in both the press corps and elsewhere, I can't tell you who's registered as a foreign agent. I spend no time on the FARA page, I, l l even less on the you know, LDA, the, the Lobbying Disclosure Act page on the Hill. So do you really think that it has that, that well, stigma? Th the reason I think that you don't react that way is there are extremely few news organizations that are registered as foreign agents. There are very few advocacy organizations. There are very few think tanks that are registered as foreign agents. Were that to change and some of them be required to register as foreign agents, I think you'd absolutely notice it. And I can tell you with certainty that there are a lot of international media organizations that perceive they would have difficulty conducting interviews difficulty engaging in the art of reporting in the United States if they're labeled as a foreign agent. And you know, it's one thing to say, I understand John's point, that if you had a news organization that is really nothing but an agent of a foreign government for influence purposes, that's one category. The, the challenge is that there are all kinds of countries in this world with many different kinds of systems, many of which have much closer relationships between their governments and their news organizations. That doesn't mean that all of those news organizations act purely as an agent of influence. It's, they're hybrids, there's a spectrum, and FARA doesn't respect nuance. It doesn't recognize that spectrum. The Department of Justice can in its discretion in terms of how it enforces the statute, but that's really the fundamental problem with the statute is that it gives prosecutors hugely vast discretion to pick which cases they want to pursue and which not. So that would that would argue for a degree of specificity and even perhaps a, 
a, a, an, an embrace of, of categories or, or yes. uh, th where where there would be decisions that would be made uh, by you know by DOJ or this actually this was delegated to DOJ from the State Department wasn't it um, originally uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The State right so it used yeah. to be sort of a foreign policy decision right. and now it's a legal decision which right. is also interesting um, but just so, to, to bear a block ahead. point um, so I gather there's nothing that would really um, distinguish someone, say, reporting for RT or a guest commentator who comes on on a regular basis on RT um, from being considered a foreign agent herself, other than the discretion of prosecutors uh, to say, look, we're, it would be ridiculous for us to start prosecuting those individuals. Um, you don't want a statute to be so broad and general that sensible charging decisions um, are the only thing that stand between you and a, and a real potential abuse of the statute. So, so one thing that, that's very interesting to me here is, is this modernity question. You know, we're talking about Russia mm -hmm. today, but the truth is Russia today, uh, or, you know, is, is exactly the same as, a, as, a, as, as uh, God, what was it called during the Soviet era? It's a tea Pravda. Well, Pravda was the, tea, was the <laughs> newspaper, but, um, but yes, I mean, mm -hmm. these, are, it, these are the same. The reality, of course, is that we have a much more complex environment now in which we have Twitter and we have Facebook advertising campaigns mm -hmm. and we have um, <coughs> news platforms. Um, one of the things that Al Jazeera did was that they started a news platform that is not to anyone's obvious eyes Al Jazeera called AJ+. Plus. Mm -hmm. um, which was intended to appeal to a different audience, but still pressed a particular viewpoint in a much more subtle way. So mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we navigate this? I, I, it's the hardest question for you, so I'm gonna make you answer it first. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, it's always the same, to us it's always the same question, and yes, there's certainly an exercise of discretion as there is in the application of most criminal law. Um, but, it's always a question of you know what what are the facts that you know and, and do you have a record that shows that the person is acting you know at the direction and control of this foreign government so if the foreign government is speaking through Twitter and it has an individual who they have hired or otherwise pay and they they that person pretends they're not the foreign government but they're speaking through Twitter then they could, they could be an agent of a foreign government so it's always a question of what the the facts that we have can show about the amount of control that the foreign principal is exercising over the actions of that person. But your job is much, much harder because, of course, you know, you don't have to dislike, I, I can just be, you know, DP828 and no one will ever know who I am and what I am. Oh, where I mean, I that's for sure. And it's not just the FARA issue, right? I mean, this is the problem of, of basically, you know, foreign interference more generally. It's a right. lot harder if people are anonymizing themselves over the internet. Uh, than it was before. Now, it's not, look, Farrah was passed because people were also were writing letters to the editor and pretending they weren't who they were, <laughs> right? So it, it's a problem that existed even when we had written newspapers, uh, and that's all we had, uh, and radio. But, um, but that is for sure a difficulty, and that's one that we're confronting generally when it comes to foreign interference, especially in the election context. So, Rob, what, what would you fix? How would you... How would the statute look if you had the pen? How long do you have? There's so many things I would fix. You have two minutes. The first thing I would do is I would encourage the department to issue more regulations, to have rulemaking proceedings with notice and comment um, so that the statute can be updated. One of the problems with FARA is there's been very little active guidance over 80 years from the department. Until last year, when the department made the great decision to start releasing advisory opinions, they were essentially secret opinions, and even now we don't have, for the most part, the opinions that were issued before 2010. So I would release all of the opinions from the beginning of the statute for complete transparency, since it is a transparency statute. I would have several rulemakings probably to update the statute to 21st century standards. I would eliminate the word request from the definition of agency, which is an unreasonably and dangerously overbroad term, I would revise the definition of political consultant, which is extraordinarily broad and a major problem for nonprofit organizations. So a host of things that I would do to clarify the commercial exemption. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. Yes, what do you think? So I guess I want to understand better, what is the, I, I, let's put aside for a second the questions of vagueness, which are sort of always a problem in statutes that we should try to fix. but. 
what is it, what's the problem that you're trying to get at through those other changes? Sure. I mean, do you want it, I mean, you know, what's the line you're trying to draw when you want the transparency of the foreign government acting and when you don't? So I, I basically, to answer that question, can't set aside vagueness because to me that's the fundamental um, issue. But is that the only issue? It sounds to me like you want to fix more than vagueness. If that's the only issue, you know, that, that's it's the separate. It's the principal issue. In addition to that, I, I do think that I would draw a sharper distinction between a governmental agency and the activity of nonprofits and private organizations. You understandably put a lot of emphasis on the role of governments, and mm -hmm. I, I understand that as a policy matter. One of the problems with the statute, though, mm -hmm. is you can have situations where there's essentially no direct government agency. So for example, mm -hmm. within the commercial exemption, the commercial exemption under the regulations will not apply if just, the activity it, directly promotes... Will you explain what you just said sure. so that folks understand? Uh, there, there's a very significant exemption to the statute, which says that even if you're engaging in activities that would otherwise trigger FARA registration, you'd have an exit ramp. You wouldn't have to register. If you were engaging in um, bona fide commercial activity on behalf of, say, a foreign corporation, a foreign individual, but that exit ramp will only work for you, it will only apply if your activity in the United States doesn't directly promote the interests of a foreign government. And nobody really knows what that means. So in other words, you might not have a foreign government client at all. There may be no foreign government role vis-a-vis -vis your activity. But the nature of the issue itself might be such that what you're doing benefits a foreign government in some way, directly promotes the foreign government's interest. Now, it could be read differently, but read literally, you actually could have a requirement to register even without any foreign government role. So that's what I would identify as my second major concern apart from vagueness. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if I could I just clarify the difference between vagueness, though, and overbreadth. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are two separate problems. The statute is vague because there are all these undefined terms. Um, one of the worst ones, uh, which you haven't mentioned, is political activities. What counts as a political activity? But the, but the issue of overbreath is that the prosecution under the statute can rope in innocent, more or less innocent activities that weren't meant to be targeted by the statute, at least on the face of it. And, and so I think we should add that as a sort of separate concern. And that raises real notice issues with the statute, which is a, which is a serious constitutional problem, potentially. What's strange to me about this whole conversation is we're talking as if the statute, the problem with the statute is that we've had over enforcement. Whereas the real problem with this statute is we have had under enforcement. So maybe these will be concerns going forward. I mean, if it's, for instance, you talk about media organizations, we've applied that in a very limited context, right? But we're talking about it like we've been out there labeling, you know, all these independent journalists in the UK as agents of but foreign I, governments. So yeah. it's, I'm not, that's why I say I'm not sure what the problem is that we're trying to solve in this conversation. And I'm not against, you know, there are improvements we could make both in terms of sort of, you know, more transparency and, you know, perhaps in defining some of these terms and we could talk about what the right mechanism is. But the whole um, conversation seems to me coming at it from sort of a counterfactual. But don't you think we've had under enforcement because of the vagueness and overbreath problem? That's, it's part of the reason why it's been difficult for DOJ to enforce it. Uh, there are other reasons. I mean, I would, I would say it hasn't, it, hasn't, it hasn't been a concern or a yeah. priority, and that's what the last election changed. I want to just talk about a, a different issue, and that this is, a, this is the sort of the political problem of Farah, but it's, it's, you know, we tend to see this through the prism of some of the prosecutions and the influence of uh, operations that took place in the 2016 election. But of course, this actually became a big issue when John McCain ran for president, when, it was for, when he, for the first time, banned lobbyists from working on his campaign. And this, and, and this sort of conversation about lobbyists being sort of the, you know, the stuff beneath the pond scum um, uh, came to the fore. Um, then there was the added veneer that even if you were a lobbyist, God forbid, if you were Farah registered, then you were somehow engaging in something 
fundamentally un-American. And people who have FARA registrations now are disincentivized from re registering, not simply by the vagueness, but by the fact that it has this stigma attached to it. I think the A number one broad question is, should it have this stigma attached to it? And is that the, is that the intention? Because this is something also to talk about. Anyway. Well, I would just say, look, the language of the statute was designed to stigmatize. Because at the time, 1938, it was directed, after, directed against Nazis. So it appropriately was intended to stigmatize. So the term foreign agent was selected for that purpose. And I think it's difficult to, to remove the stigma um, after 80 years. What you can do, though, is be much more targeted in, in how it's applied. Um, I think given the history of, of light enforcement, that reflects the exercise of discretion by the department to be very careful about how it uses this incredibly powerful statute. But to my mind, it just highlights the fact that the government shouldn't have that much power. It needs to be constrained and targeted to what we all, I think, agree is the essential mission, which is dealing with you know, hostile attempts to influence our electoral systems. Right now, it's much broader than that, in my view. Um, I think that, that a certain amount of stigma is appropriate if you are covertly in the pay of a foreign government and not disclosing that. So, I mean, that's where the, the appropriate stigma lies. But, but why should there be stigma around working for a foreign government mm -hmm. as long as it's routinely disclosed? Um, I think some of that would start to fall away. So if Farah was um, clearly enforced and we knew what counted as a... a foreign agent and who wasn't a foreign agent, and we had a much more robust practice of registration, I think little by little we would start to see a, a sort of general acceptance as the public was able to rely more clearly on now we know that this messaging is coming from you know, Russia and, and this is a, a, a non-foreign influenced um, campaign. Do you think the genie can be stuffed in the bottle, John? So, I mean, I mean, it's interesting the way you frame it, Claire, because really the stigma then arises from getting charged under the statute because you didn't because register. You didn't register. Right? <laughs> not, be, not because you did register in the statute yeah. itself. I don't think, as, as, I, as I said before, I have no problem with foreign governments speaking in the United States and expressing their views on matters of tremendous interest to them. The only thing this statute is trying to get at is when you speak, Say who you're speaking on behalf of. Say who's paying you. You know, that's really the core of when we think about enforcement and, and you know, who we expect to register under the statute. That's really the, the core issue that I think the statute is meant to address. And I don't know that there doesn't need to be a stigma. I mean, look, the word lobbyist is, has a stigma, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But, but there's nothing inherent in, the, in sort of advocating on behalf of somebody else that should be stigmatizing, right? I mean, that's a... That's First Amendment, too. It's a, you know, you're going to exercise your First Amendment rights through me. That's fine. But it, I, so I don't see it as a stigma for somebody to register under FARA. Um, you know, I see it as a stigma if they don't, right? But, you know, if they do, th th um, that's okay. But it's very interesting because maybe somebody, you know, has an unpop a politically unpopular country that they're registering on behalf of. And so maybe the stigma comes from the client and being open about who you're speaking on behalf of. I don't think there's the same stigma of registering as an agent of the UK as there is as registering as the agent of a number of other countries, and I'm not going to mention. <laughs> <laughs> but you can all choose. <laughs> so so um, we just have a couple more minutes before I open it up to questions. I want to talk a little bit about my world selfishly, um, which is the world of 501c3s, the world of think tanks. Because we are, and it, this is a, kind of the other side of the journalism coin in some ways. You know, how do we all operate? Well, um, AEI doesn't take any money from foreign governments or from the US government. That's, you know, that's, that's our policy, and so it makes it, it makes it easy for us. But of course, we, we have a president who's a very good fundraiser. It's actually hard to raise money for think tanks. And it's very tempting, uh, as we know from a number of our mates who, um, who take money from, from foreign governments. But increasingly, this is an opportunity to also exercise um, influence through individuals. Congress has gone after this in, actually on the House side, in forcing witnesses to disclose whether their institution takes any foreign government money. But is this, 
a, am I wrong to perceive this as a problem? I, by the way, I'm not wrong. But you know, I'm, I'm, pre <laughs> I'm pretending to ask as if as if I'm balanced and and, and fair-minded about this. Um, uh, can can you all talk about how you see this? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree it's a problem, and um, uh, there is an exemption under the statute for scholarly activities. So you you would like to have that category clearly defined and understood, <coughs> so that um, uh, there's not a chilling of speech and a chilling of academic research, but what constitutes a scholarly activity and, and what is a political activity, um, the statute's unclear about that. So I think it, whenever a statute is, is unclear and you don't know exactly what's happening with an enforcement regime, you tend to get over compliance out of concern about uh, chilling uh, I don't think there's any overcompliance compliance. in my neck of the woods. You may, you may start <laughs> to see that. I'm not aware, I'm not aware of any think tanks, certainly but you're institutionally. Right to be the, worried but, about that. And by the way, they're not compatible. I don't think you can fire a register and, and stay as a 501c3. Rob? Yeah, you can. You can? Oh, good. Well, we have a whole future funding stream I wasn't aware of. <laughs> um, uh, how do you see this? Well, you know, um, some of my favorite clients are think tanks, um, but I will say think tanks face a significant challenge with respect to FARA. Um, some of them do accept money from, by the way, not just foreign governments, but other foreign principles, foreign corporations, foreign NGOs, all of which are relevant to FARA. It's not just about foreign governments by the terms of the statute. Um, and when they do accept money, the critical thing is to establish either that they fall within this exemption for scholastic or academic activity, or that they're not really acting as an agent, right? So you can accept money to support your existing mission and things that you would be doing to serve that mission without, without necessarily triggering agency. But it can be very difficult. This comes back to the vagueness point and the discretion point. It can be very difficult for a think tank to know where is that line between accepting money from a foreign donor to support our existing projects and mission versus beginning to act on their behalf or at their request under the statute. That's another point where it can be a, a difficult judgment call. And difficult judgment calls chill activity. Mm -hmm. They don't chill that much activity, <laughs> <laughs> if I may say so. Is this something that you all have thought about at all? This is something you know we, we probably ought to be giving more thought to. I mean, this is but this is a classic problem I think faced by any academic institution uh, and its donors, right? What what degree of Independent, independent judgment do you maintain from your donors, right? And this is a problem we see in universities where they, and it doesn't have to be a foreign donor, right? And it could be an American donor who gives a lot of money. And there's always this question of, well, what are they getting for their money, right? Are they, are they just funding this college because they love it, or are they trying to get a professor with particular viewpoints to express a view that they have for whatever, you know, ideological or other reasons? So I think this is a, you know, and that's an issue, I guess, for think tanks that they have to think of, not just in the context of FARA, but generally, to maintain their credibility and their uh, editorial independence. In the context of FARA, you know, we haven't brought any enforcement actions in this uh, context, but it's, uh, you know, thanks for flagging it. <laughs> 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 okay, last issue, what about enforcement? Okay, this is an interesting question. You know, Clara, you, when you and I talked, um, you know, you, you said, you know, you get the feeling that this is kind of the thing that they tack on when they're throwing the book at you. Um, and, and that it doesn't really arise separate from that. And Rob, you corrected me and said, have there been seven or eight prosecutions? There was a 50 year period with about seven prosecutions. And last year there were five. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so, uh, how, how are we to understand that? I, you know, as I think I said at the beginning, I mean, I think we, it, it was before I was here, but we were you know, sort of certainly driven by an inspector general's report that outlined the deficiencies in our enforcement of this statute, and then also um, by what we saw in the, uh, the context of doing the investigations that related to the 2016 elections and the um, pervasiveness of uh, foreign influence in, in that case, in, in sort of in our democratic process. Now, it's just one tool that we have to address it. We do have other statutes that we can use to address this behavior, depending on how it's manifested. Um, but I think, you know, in light of uh, the increased sensitivity to the problem of covert foreign influence, you know, we should expect to see, 
you know, a continued focus on, on this area in terms of enforcement. And not just, not just measured by criminal cases. I mean, as we think critically about the way we've approached uh, FARA and think about the need to do more inspections of people who have declared, the need to send out more deficiency letters, that is be more, pay more attention to the content of their registration and make sure that it is fulsome and it meets all the requirements of the act. Um, and uh, the opportunity to use the civil uh, enforcement provision of the statute is not just a criminal penalty. You know, these are all areas where I think we can um, do better at the department and we can get better uh, compliance with the transparency requirements of the statute. For FARA lawyers, the last point John made is sort of newsy, uh, which would be the use of the civil injunction authority that the department has and has not really, it's not really used very much up until now. Well, and the fact that there's no ability right now to really um, investigate, to issue subpoenas, and to have a civil side of this, as you say, um, uh, all of which would make enforcement more possible. I think the, the reason for the anxiety about the vagueness and the overbreath, however, is when you're moving from a regime of total under-enforcement to enormous public scrutiny on this issue, pressure uh, to engage in more enforcement, enormous concern about foreign influence, and thinking somehow FARA might be the tool to counter that, um, one has the feeling you have no idea what, it, what the enforcement regime is going to look like. So it's somewhat reassuring to hear you, um, uh, as sensible um, brains in the Department of Justice thinking about these problems. Uh, but uh, I do think that uh, we can expect to see a, a lot of very skittish people in a lot of different sectors until it gets sorted out. Until well, it has, it's having its moment right now, just yeah. like right, yeah. just like nanny taxes had their moment, and, <laughs> right. and now everybody's gone back to not paying the taxes for their nannies. Um, <laughs> none of you, uh, I know. Another enforcement tip. <laughs> <laughs> just, just come to me. It's another income stream for AI. Uh, let's, let's open it up for, for questions from folks, and I, I oops, excuse me. Um, thank you. And, uh, and, and if there's something that I haven't brought up, I hope that uh, one of you all will flag it. Uh, if you would not mind following AEI's usual rules, which is wait for me to call on you, wait for a microphone, identify yourself, and put your really brilliant but brief statement in the form of a question. <laughs> Young man right over there, and I'll just keep dropping <laughs> stuff while you do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you, uh, John Demers, for, for joining and all the rest of the panel. Um, my name is Nick Robinson. Um, I'm a legal advisor at the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. We work on closing civic space issues, uh, both here in the US and globally. And as you may know, when there has been increased enforcement of FARA, in the past, we have seen these abuses, um, kind of politicized abuses. So famously, W.E.B. Du Bois was prosecuted in the 1950s under FARA. Um, just last summer, there was a congressional committee that investigated four prominent U.S. environmental nonprofits about whether they were in violation of FARA. Um, and we've seen this abroad, where foreign agent laws have been explicitly targeting uh, nonprofits and the media. And so I'm curious about what kind of additional safeguards you'd like to see either in the act or what you're contemplating as you're now ramping up enforcement um, to make sure these kinds of abuses that kind of go to the vagueness and the broadness of the act. And one last point, we do talk to our nonprofits on a regular basis who are very concerned about this and don't know how to comply because mm -hmm. as has been pointed out, foreign principle is very broad, the agency definition is very broad, it's just confusing. Mm -hmm. Rob's a really good lawyer, a FARA lawyer, if you guys need one. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and take that? I, yeah, I mean, look, the, um, partisanship can never enter into any of the decisions we do, and that's not just true in the fair. That's true of every single thing that I do um, at the department and everything that the department does. So what you describe would be wholly inappropriate. Um, the good thing about the act is it's content neutral, right? So it's not, it, it doesn't, it's not triggered by what you're saying. It's triggered by who's asking you to say it. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's the way our um, you know, enforcement will be, which is content neutral. And that gets to some of the First Amendment concerns as well, because we're not going to make judgments about um, what the person is, is saying. Uh, it can be difficult, because, you know, especially if people are speaking through the internet, to figure that out. But again, we're not triggered 
by the content of the statement. It's about who, who's putting it up there. But look, that is something um, uh, that is, uh, you know, it, it, it's a constant refrain for those of us at the Justice Department that we cannot apply these laws in ways that are um, in any way partisan. What, one caveat about the content neutrality. I mean, if RT were constantly coming out with statements critical of the Russian government, I doubt that they would have been required to, to register, right? So, so the problem then, is Then that they wouldn't have been an agent of the Russian government. A, a, exactly, so there is a content test buried in there, right? Because it's partly the content that tells you whether or not it that agency relationship were... exists. That's, that's yeah, just a so caveat that's, that's to what a you good say. Point. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, you brought up another point, though, which was a question that I was going to ask you, which is um, how worried are we as we step up enforcement and, uh, and scrutiny and add clarity to, to some of Farah's um, provisions that um, other countries are going to start um, looking at their own obverse version of the, of the same thing? I'm, and I'm not even talking about bad guys. I'm not talking about the Russians or the Egyptians <coughs> pretending that, well, you have an NGO law, we have an NGO law, and you know, mm -hmm. you, you require Farah, we require. Not so much that, but even our European allies and others who might start to uh, apply standards to our own uh, companies and, uh, and, and, uh, and individuals working over there. Are we worried about things like that? Um, I, I'm no one who would be closer to that, whether it's at the State Department and the intelligence community has expressed that concern. I think it would be legitimate for a European country to say to uh, somebody uh, there that, hey, you've got to identify yourself if you're speaking on behalf of the United States. Uh, so, I, you know, this, again, is not a law that I think is, is unique to us. And um, so that hasn't, it hasn't been a concern. We'll, we'll see. We'll see if it becomes one. Yeah. Okay, folks. Yes, sir. Sorry, the microphone is navigating its way to you. <laughs> this gentleman here. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Jules Zacker. Uh, I'm on the board of Searle, but uh, I'm asking this question as a citizen, a private citizen, mm -hmm. and I would like to ask you some questions about the. Uh, Prosecution of Greg Craig under the uh, fire. Uh, no, sorry. I, I promised we're not going to talk about this. Uh, he can't talk about specific individual cases, and so I'm going to be the bad guy here. Do you have a more general question that you'd like to ask? Uh, I didn't hear you saying that at the beginning. I'm sorry. I should have given you a fair warning, but I didn't think anybody would ask that question, actually. So I promised. Well, then I will not ask my question. Thank you. You're Anyone welcome. else? Yes, sir. Are the subjects of uh, hang on one second. <laughs> Mike? Subjects of individual cases allowed to ask questions? I, I don't know. I shouldn't think My so. My name's Sam Patton, and I believe I'm the ninth conviction under FARA in American history, or at least post-war post history. And in an abundance of caution, I wouldn't ask about uh, a question regarding my own case, to which I pled guilty. When I did, the judge made note of the fact that uh, the vagueness, if, should the law uh, at some point later in time be struck down for vagueness, my conviction would stand. I think vagueness is real. I think vagueness is something that needs to be addressed, but I think some of the panelists addressed that well. We don't so need to get into that. What's your question? My question has to do with the NGO exclusion. And let's take a hypothetical, for instance, a country that's come into a lot of uh, attention recently is Ukraine. Uh, there's a presidential election this Sunday in Ukraine. Let's say the think tank community uh, sort of believe that one candidate should win. Let's say there was a think tank uh, that received funding from supporters of that particular candidate that issued and disseminated uh, opinion pieces arguing for that candidate's victory. Is there a reason why that shouldn't be applicable under Farrah? Good. So this is, this is really, I hope, what we were going to with this question, because this is... Um, you know, especially um, especially as there is a stigma attached to FARA registration and to lobbying, and something else we talked about, which is that um, often countries, uh, because of course, with a FARA registration, you have to also post your contract, which is available to any one of you when you leave. You can go on the FARA page and pull up an individual uh, FARA registrant's contract and see what it is that the foreign principal 
company, uh, a political party, wanted you to do in, in great detail. Well, they don't often, especially political parties, don't want to share that great detail, which is a perverse incentive, of course, to find other avenues to have that kind of influence. So that, there's a good hypothetical. We don't, it doesn't have to be Ukraine, because it can be anywhere. Um, is that a fair, should that be a fair or registrable act? Rob? Well, I mean, a, a threshold question is whether there's agency for a foreign government or foreign political party. Right, so you can have activity by a U.S. nonprofit that involves, you know, U.S. elections or foreign elections, where it's not necessarily on behalf of a foreign principle. But if you do have evidence of agency, um, generally speaking, it is likely to trigger the statute. Of course, these things are often not knowable. I mean, part of the reason why you want the contract is to actually understand what the foreign principal is asking the American to do, I, I would assume. Is that right? Yeah, what the nature of the relationship is. Right, what the right. nature of the, the nature, relationship is. How much is. control they have, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. so uh, how, how, does, how does that judgment in your, as when you advise, Rob, a, a client about that, how does that judgment get made? You know, every organization is different, and every organization has different challenges and risk tolerances and different constituencies and stakeholders that they have to, that they have to weigh in making those um, decisions. It's not just about the registration itself, by the way, but once you are registered, apart from having to disclose all of your activities in, in great detail, you also have to file with the Department of Justice any document or writing or email or text that you distribute to two or more persons basically without regard to the content of that document. It goes up on the public website. And so that has a real effect on constraining the operations of the organization. But every organization is going to have different equities to weigh in making that decision. But it is, I mean, I think there are a lot of perverse incentives. It is a, it is a challenge Danny, and an interesting one. Absolutely. Brief here. Um, I just want to commend Mr. Patton for, for speaking openly about his situation and, and helping us to deepen our, our understanding of, of this situation in a very murky area of, of policy. Um, so thank you. Yes, sir. Right. <clears throat> there are nine bills pending. I'm on sorry. The... Would you identify yourself? Sure. I'm Jim Thurber. I'm a professor at American University. I teach a course on ethics and lobbying, and we focused on we focused on FARA or FARA, depending on who you are, uh, for quite a while. <laughs> I, I have a very specific question, and that is, there are nine bills on the Hill. It's highly polarized, likely not to go any, they're likely not to go anywhere. Therefore, you have to shift, in my opinion, to you and to the Department of Justice in terms of, of improving the act, including um, trying to do something about the vagueness of agency, agent, foreign principle, political activities. My question is, do you intend to have, as was recommended, uh, a rulemaking process to try to define those a little more carefully so there's not that vagueness out there that's worrying so many people? So um, that, this is something that we you know, continue to evaluate in terms both of, you know, whether there are statutory changes that we would support and what we can do internally, uh, you know, in the meantime or, or in addition to any statutory changes. So we haven't made any decisions about doing um, any kind of administrative rulemaking process or anything like that. Of course, you know, having a Congress, a you know, bunch of men and women sitting up there, one might ask why they wouldn't have hearings to figure this out which would be certainly a good process mm -hmm. of leading to a deeper understanding of the direction in which we might mm -hmm. go. But, but that's just they me. Had, yeah, they had a hearing about, what was it 2017, I guess, was the last hearing? Yeah. Era. Good topic. See, I'm full of tips today. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Clay, did you have a question? Back here. I'm Clay Fuller. I'm the Gene Kirkpatrick Fellow in Foreign and Defense Policy Studies. Uh, I work for AEI, but AEI does not take institutional positions on anything, so my opinions are mine and mine alone. Um, oh my, I am full of dread now. <laughs> <laughs> I study uh, authoritarian disinformation campaigns, and uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is the... Uh, 
the unwitting foreign agent, uh, specifically in social media and the anonymous accounts uh, going out there, the, the grandmother that's sharing viral you mm -hmm. know, Russian posts or whatever. <laughs> when we deputize the private sector to become the law enforcement agent on this, this also like, creates free, spa free speech issues over censorship. Why, how are they choosing which accounts to shut down or to go after? Um, how are they going to do that? How, how are they transparent about that? And I'm wondering if there's some kind of applica applicability uh, of FARA to that issue. I think, I mean, one of the protections I think you would have in that context is it has to be a willful violation of the statute in order to be a prosecutable offense. So someone who's unwittingly, you know, retweeting the tweets of a foreign power is not acting willfully. Uh, so that, that's, I think, the in terms of the statutory protection, that, that's where it would be. And, and very often when you have a statute that is potentially overbroad or vague, having a willfulness requirement in it helps to counter <coughs> some of that. But um, one worry is that you might get sort of manipulation of that. So if, if you want to make sure you don't run afoul of the statute, then make sure not to ask where the, what the source is of the um, funds you're getting or the, or the um, information that you're getting, whose position you're, you're pressing. So you don't want strategic behavior um, to, ev to evade a willfulness finding. Right, although one has to know something to be strategic in the first place. So if you're, if if you're gaming it, you probably right. already had a hint. But sort of does willful blindness count as satisfying the right. willfulness requirement? Maybe you can tell us. <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. I don't. <laughs> not, not wanting to know is apparently your best defense, um, and certainly that's true in Washington. But uh, this. <laughs> but, the, but the other thing, Danny, just, yes. uh, just one more thing to add to that, which is it's really important if Farah's going to actually do anything to um, help educate the American public, it's going to have to be coupled with educational efforts so that when the public finds out, yes, this is from a foreign government, they know how to digest that, they know what that means, uh, they know what the implications are. So hopefully when there's greater transparency, then the grandma is not going to be retweeting the, the, you know, the foreign propaganda because they come to have a better understanding of, of the damage that that can do. Uh, but you know, when I said that Farah was having its moment, I, I meant it. You know, if, if if, in fact, you are a foreign government that seeks to subvert or seeks to influence anonymously or otherwise, there are so many better tools than hiring Joe Blow, former Hill staffer, to do it for you. you know, there's the internet. There is Facebook. There are the, the inserts, the China Daily insert that we get in the Washington Post where democracy dies in darkness, um, but not the China Daily section. Um, you know, these are, these, that's the reality. There are, there are tons and tons of, of these. So this sort of um, disclosure and transparency is, I think, something that will be helpful. But of course, it just leaves an entire murky world on the other side. Um, am I leaving anybody out? Let's have this be the last question from this gentleman over here. I, our, our intern is getting a huge amount of exercise here. <laughs> uh, my name is Obred Kesic, and I'm a registered foreign agent. Uh, so, uh, and everything it implies. Um, uh, I, oh, one, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, with the, with the stigma, because you can see how the faces change as soon as you have to say that. But uh, let me start uh, first by uh, complimenting uh, your staff. Every single time we've ever had a question and we've had to call in, they've been extremely polite, uh, probably uh, some of the nicest people we've ever had to interact with uh, through 25 years of working in Washington, D.C. So that's first Thank and you. foremost. Uh, secondly, uh, it's beyond st stigma uh, because as a U.S. citizen, I have adverse consequences for doing this job. I represent a foreign government. Their trade, I run their trade office. And some of the things that's happened is that I'm not, I'm limited in terms of my political activism and I've been very active in the past, uh, but it really identifies you and you, it puts you almost on a watch list so that you don't get the invitations you used to, you don't have the exposure you used to, you're curtailed in terms of what you can participate in because people are afraid, especially over the last couple of years. Uh, so that 
putting it out there, I think I d haven't heard anybody uh, address this issue from my point of view, from the person who's registering, uh, in the sense of all of these curtailments of your rights as a U.S. citizen. And the second part of my question is also perspective uh, from a U.S. citizen. I have a very difficult time accepting the justifications concerning uh, uh, journalists who are forced to register. Because I see that as one step away from, let's say, let's take another hypothetical situation, a combat situation, where journalists are involved in covering a war, a conflict. If they're forced to register in the United States as foreign agents, doesn't that deprive them of protection under the wars, the, the, the law of uh, rule of wars? So. Okay. Good last question. I mean, I can speak to that last issue, which is that, and this is the part that's really confusing, which is losing your congressional press staff uh, status, excuse me, doesn't necessarily mean that you've lost um, your press status for purposes of the law of armed conflict. And I, I think this is a, um, going to be a very confusing issue, which is why I have some concern about using Farah as a vehicle to decredential press, there ought to be a more unified approach and an international approach to who counts as press. And what about this, this, the, the first part of this question, you know, this, this notion that people are, are, are basically, you know, in a separate part of society now? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the department's traditional answer would be, look, it's just a disclosure statute. So by registering, you're just signing up to have to reveal your activities. But I do think that in many contexts, there are real practical consequences. How much we care about those practical consequences is a policy question. But we've just heard a pretty um, compelling uh, explanation of how that works in practice for an individual. There's no question that it's a problem in terms of credentialing uh, for journalists. There's no question that registered foreign agents find their US political activities constrained. Again, it's a value judgment or a policy judgment about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think it accurately describes reality. And there's not really any remedy for that, is there? It's no, no, not that part. I mean, those are the actions of other people you know, reacting to a registration. So, um, but I, look, I, I appreciate your perspective very much and your comments. Thank you. And uh, I very much appreciate all three of you being here today. Thank you so much. This was a terrific conversation. I want to make one final point. I hope everybody understands, especially this nice gentleman here. When we have people from the U.S. government, and we have, and when we have lawyers here, frankly, asking questions about particular individuals is always very fraught. And it's my job up here to be the heavy and the enforcer, and to ensure that we don't step on people's privacy rights and that we don't put other people in awkward positions. I hope everybody forgives us for that, but, uh, but we do have a public interest here. Thank you all so much for being here.